Thank you very much, Joshua. I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me and for putting together a nice group of papers and discussants. Uh, Philip, I enjoyed your presentation, and I'm going to try to supplement it or complement it and maybe build on it a bit. Um, let me see if I've got this right. Yes. So that's my disclaimer. I'm speaking on my own behalf, nobody else's. In a few days, that will become institutionalized because I will formally retire from the IMF, just to let you know in advance. So I really am speaking for myself. Before I actually turn to my presentation, I want to um, discuss some caveats that I listed on the first two pages of the paper that I'm I'm presenting. I encourage you to take a look at the paper because I'm just going to sort of zip through the main thoughts within the paper and the main challenges rather than going through the whole paper. But I first want to note that it's almost three years since the beginning of this global crisis. It's close to, t it's, it's more than two years since Bear Stearns was rescued. And it's more than a year and a half since Lehman Brothers was allowed to go through a very public bankruptcy, which in effect was the trigger for the global systemic crisis that, um, in my view, we're still experiencing. It's not over yet. Um, the several caveats, let me, let me discuss those and let me make sure I don't miss one of them. These caveats are basically my biases and they will show up in the presentation and I wanted to make them clear. First of all, I think this crisis could have been avoided. I sincerely believe that. There were warning signs. There were even some vocal warning signs. The problem is that the discipline, the work of financial stability analysis, has not developed to the point where a policymaker who needs to make hard decisions and convince policy of, of politicians that those hard decisions need to be taken, that discipline is not really fully developed to the point where we can convince a politician that action must be taken. This is something we need to develop. Financial stability analysis is probably where macroeconomic policy analysis must have been 50 years ago. We have a long way to go, hopefully not 50 years, maybe only five. The, the second bias is that the distinction between macroprudential and microprudential, in practice, actually in the operational aspects of it, it's not such a clear distinction. Just consider systemically important financial institutions. If one of those were to be in trouble, meaning if the micro supervision were not conducted successfully, that in itself requires a macro prudential response. So it's not so clear cut. Um, and if you go back and reflect on, on two of Philip's slides where he was listing off the macro prudential tools, many of them were in fact of a microprudential nature. And I think that is why Philip and I focus on managing systemic risk as the objective rather than macroprudential versus microprudential. We should be trying to manage systemic risk. So that's another bias of mine. Um, a third is that I've, I've I grew up basically in my profession working for the Federal Reserve in Washington. And while I was working on macroeconomics, it didn't take me very long to figure out that in the conduct of exercising monetary stability, you cannot ignore financial markets, you cannot ignore the transmission mechanism, which in all countries is both institutions and markets. So monetary stability, 
and financial stability go hand in hand. You'll see that bias come through. Okay, let me start the um, formal presentation now. Um, I sincerely believe that reform efforts at this stage are incomplete. So I think it's still useful to think about what was the pre-crisis policy framework that we are trying to adjust. How and why did this so-called architecture fail? What are the reform proposals now being discussed, intensely now, between the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives, just for an example? And what are some of the unaddressed systemic weaknesses that I still see out there? If there's time permitting, I'll give you my optimal set of policies. Ha uh ha. -huh. Um, I'm going to run out of time. So the three main points you should walk away with are that the pre-crisis patchwork global architecture for preventing and, re and resolving systemic problems failed in many areas, if not all. EU and U.S. reform efforts are still works in progress. And I think Philip just gave us a good example of how the European Systemic Risk Board is still a work in progress. And there have been few tangible results, perhaps with the exception of the UK, which actually passed the law. There are several important weaknesses revealed by the crisis that have yet to be fully realized, fully recognized, if not dealt with. Okay, let's look at the pre-crisis policy framework, and it, it's it's organized around three slides, but let me go right to the matrix. If you look at the first row, sorry, the first column, and go down the rows, they list off, in a simplified way, lines of defense that have been put in place in countries and internationally through cooperation to safeguard financial stability from the kind of threats we saw developing three years ago. The columns define the sources of systemic risk. So it's a matrix which is looking at how the lines of defense span out across the sources of systemic risk. And the upshot of this matrix is that if you look at each and every one of these cells, there were failures that were revealed by this crisis. So the point there, and it's probably an exaggeration, all of these areas need to be fixed. And as came up during the lunch discussion, it very much involves incentives, getting the incentives right, not just for the private sector, but for the official sector. What is it that drives a supervisor to get up every morning feeling in their bellies that they need to find the imbalances in the institution that they supervise and help that institution think through the solution, if that's what supervision is supposed to do. Whatever supervision is supposed to do, I would like there to be incentives for every supervisor to be passionate about their work, or at least well compensated to do it well. So that's what I mean by incentives. Likewise, you need the firms that engage in finance to have a fiduciary responsibility for their shareholders and their clients and to act on it. That involves compensation systems, that involves risk management and controls and so on. Again, that's what I mean by incentives. So this matrix for me points out that there are weaknesses in many areas that need to be addressed by reform efforts. This is a list that by now we're all familiar with. It documents, more or less, what the failures were. The markets themselves, in the end, did not function when we needed them most to price the changes in risk. They, they simply stopped doing that. And that's because I think we entered the realm of uncertainty. So we were confronted with the kind of decision-making 
that requires quantification, but the environment was so uncertain it couldn't be done. So markets, which need information to price and manage risk, just simply stopped functioning. There are no easy fixes there, and it takes a combination of measures, and you can see the bullets that I listed there. We need to improve information. Instruments and exposures need to be less opaque. There are intelligent ways of doing that without endangering proprietary um, ownership of, of information, client bases, and so on. Poor incentive structures, inadequate governance up and down the lines of management, insufficient ex-ante market discipline, and ultimately a loss of trust. Secondly, official supervision failed to promote safety and soundness of the major institutions, the systemically important ones. <clears throat> market surveillance within national central banks, within regional bodies, within global platforms for discussing risks. They all failed to identify the buildup of imbalances in a way that would convince policymakers that they needed to act on them. There's no easy fix with that either, but it needs to be fixed. And then central bank and treasury tools proved to be too limited to address the kind of liquidity solvency issues that arise in modern global finance. We live in a modern financial system. Some of the central banks and some of the treasuries, in my view most notably the US, had not modernized their policy intervention tools to keep pace with the modern financial system, the liquidity hungry, credit thirsty type of financial system, which is driven by markets and institutions simultaneously. Um, I'm going to list off four reasons. There are probably ten why the existing architecture failed. First of all, the periphery, the perimeter of the supervisory and regulatory framework was wrong. It was inadequate. It was mostly about balance sheets. It was mostly nation-oriented. And it was mostly bank-oriented. Rather than off-balance sheet-oriented, more international and globally focused, and not only banking oriented, market oriented as well. Counterparties, yes, there are two counterparties and they're two big banks, but that's a market. So the market, which is composed of a network of counterparty relationships, we need better ways of s surveying those markets regularly. That requires the kind of information we didn't have before the crisis occurred and that we're still not getting now. Central banks were equipped to address the immediate liquidity problems that surfaced. The problem, of course, was that the root of the cause of this crisis wasn't liquidity. Liquidity was a manifestation. It was creditworthiness. And that's not really what central banks are supposed to do, at least in the way we think about it traditionally. It could be that in the modern financial system, from time to time, central banks need to be equipped to maybe monitor credit risk and maybe even own some occasionally. If central banks really are to safeguard financial stability, maybe they need the proper tools to own credit risk every now and then to provide a bridge for the market. That means they need to think about their work a little differently. The idea is not to own the credit risk, but to price it better than the market does with the proper haircuts and so on. And we know that problems arose in that area, both in the US and in Europe. Um, <clears throat> in the end, to save the system from itself, we needed recapitalization. That occurred at the national level. And when you consider Europe, the European single market, the fact that that had to occur at the national level, to me, is a signal that the single market needs some architectural redesign. Uh, the bottom line there is both at the regional and the global level, we are lacking the kind of balance sheet that can be used to facilitate restructuring and recapitalization. And that just blends into the next problem, 
the next reason why the architecture failed, and that is coordination in the end broke down. And just consider the examples of Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers was a global financial conglomerate, and yet the U.S. authorities worried about the U.S. and it didn't really care about Lehman Brothers Asia and Lehman Brothers London. Consider Fortis. Fortis was owned and regulated by entities licensed in three countries which have a pretty good record of supervising, working together hand in hand in regulating that institution. And initially there was a coordinated effort to help the bank and get it back on its feet. But within a week that broke down into national ring fencing and national bailouts. So here is one case where you would have expected that cooperation would have worked. It was almost hardwired, and yet it failed. That's an indication of how hard it is to do this and why we need um, leaders of countries to command their subordinates to get better at coordinating across borders. I'm going to skip the reform proposals. The U.S. reform proposals and the EU reform proposals are all moving in the same direction. My view is not enough has been done. We still don't have a bill out of the U.S. Congress. We may get one by the end of the year, but I still think it's imperfect. And let me go to that last slide. What are some of the unaddressed systemic weaknesses that are really not dealt with in the bills? These bills are complex. They address many issues. But my view is they are not realigning the balance between market discipline and official oversight. Before the crisis, we didn't have enough official oversight to enforce the rule of market discipline. Now that we're still in crisis management role, it's an exaggeration, but there is no market for there to be discipline, and there's too much official oversight. So we can't seem to get that balance right. That pendulum swings from one extreme to the other. And I think that's because incentives are misaligned. They're misaligned within the regulatory framework, within the supervisory agencies, and certainly within the firms that engage in the bulk of global finance. We need to fix that. It's a hard problem, but it needs to be done. We need to reconsider the intertemporal benefits and costs of having institutions of such a nature, their global reach, their complexity, their interconnectedness, and sometimes their size, though that, that's less of an issue. Do we really need financial conglomerates to capture the efficiency gains that we require for efficient economic growth? I am skeptical. Most of the justifications for having large conglomerates operating across the globe doing many businesses, insurance, banking, investment banking, merchant banking, and the like, is that there are economies of scale and economies of scope. There are no studies that demonstrate economies of scope, and if anything, they demonstrate the opposite. Firms that are conglomerates often trade at a discount relative to the separate businesses. So that's number one. That justification just doesn't hold tight. The second is economies of scale. There are economies of scale, but most studies say they occur with a balance sheet of 100 billion. So why does an institution need to have a balance sheet of 2.5 trillion, which is what some of these institutions had before the crisis? They're now well below 2 trillion. So I raise that question. That, that is not adequately addressed in any piece of legislation I've seen, whether it's the US, Europe, the UK is part of Europe, but they actually passed a bill. They don't address that either. Um, <clears throat> tell me when I'm out of time. The, the um, surveillance of global markets, and by that I mean the global interbank money market, which is a huge repo market and an array of derivative markets, ranging from simple, plain, vanilla interest rate and FX swaps to very complex, opaque instruments. 
that even the creators sometimes don't understand what those instruments are and what the implications are. I'm not suggesting we should do away with financial innovation or even complexity. We just need to have more information about it. The traders themselves need more information. So do supervisors and those that are engaged in market surveillance. So we need to improve surveillance to the point where the opacity of risk is reduced significantly. We need to ensure that central banks have modern tools to co-manage simultaneously monetary and financial stability. And I'm out, of I'm out of time, so I can't talk about global governance. Thank you.